Yo, Shortbox Nation, this is Botter, and I'm here to tell you right now that con season starts early this year with the return of Northeast Florida's premier anime, comic book, and sci-fi event, Collective Con. That's right, Northeast Florida's largest pop culture convention returns for its 10th year on March 8th through the 10th at the Prime Osborne Center in Jacksonville, Florida. 10 years of Collective Con, they're pulling all the stops out to make sure this is a can't-miss event. And the guest list they got going, don't even get me started on the guest list. I mean, they've got A-list celebrity guests and voice actors from some of your favorite movies, anime, and video games like Elijah Wood and Sean Ashton, Ray Park, Trisha Helfer, Ross Marquin, Max Middleman, and bo herself would be there, Katie Sackhoff. Tell me what other convention is giving you the opportunity to meet Frodo and Sam from Lord of the Rings, Darth Maul, and One Punch Man all under the same roof. Only at Collective Con. And if you're looking to get some of your favorite comics signed, or if you want to get an original sketch from some of the best comic artists in the world, well, you're in luck because there'll be plenty of comic and creator guests there, like DC comic artist extraordinaire Clay Mann, Harvey Award nominated illustrator John Taylor Christopher, Marvel and DC cover artist Chris Stevens, and acclaimed Star Wars author Timothy Zahn. They'll all be at Collective Con this year. And if you're looking to bring the family or if you want to make a weekend out of it, you're in luck because there'll be so much going on at CollectiveCon that weekend in the form of vendors, fan panels, video game tournaments, cosplay contests, after parties, and a bunch of fan events. You can purchase single and three-day weekend passes now using the link in this episode's show notes or by going to CollectiveCon.com to book your tickets and hotel. Buy your tickets now, and I'll see you at CollectiveCon, March 8th through the 10th. Now let's start the show. Would you guys ever do a live stream of showing your art or drawing process? Like, do you feel comfortable enough drawing in front of whether it be 10 people viewing or just, you know, a bunch of people viewing online? Could you guys do that? No, I don't know. I think I could like do something and post it, but I don't think I could ever do a live stream. Same. Like a time lapse thing. I wouldn't mind doing, but like just no. I don't even like drawing out like drinking draws and stuff like that. I don't even like doing that in public. It's a very over my shoulder for me. Yeah, for me, it's it's a private thing, you know. Like that that process is private to me. So I respect that. I guess you wouldn't want, especially like considering uh, maybe some of um, some our, some fifteen year old heckling me <laughs> <laughs> like it's Call of Duty. <laughs> Boo! You suck. But I imagine like some of our of our more vocal and you know funny uh, listeners that would absolutely support you guys. I could just imagine that live stream. Imagine like a T Mix or David Morales oh in your live stream. David Morales asking you what type of mouthfeel is the beer that you're drinking. <laughs> oh, T Mix would be cursing me out in Spanish the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I feel like we are appropriately warmed up. Actually, were you excited about um, uh, Rick Remender and getting to, getting to talk about him today? I was so freaking excited. Like, I've always wanted to do an, a writer episode, and I wanted to do an Alan Moore one so badly. I got, but the, I got a shirt you guys on said, I got, I got a, you know, Oh, I love that, that shirt. <laughs> Read more. And this from the cartoonist Kayfabe uh, voice. <laughs> Damn, you um, wanted to do a writer episode this, this whole time? I hinted at it, like, a lot. <laughs> It's all right. It's all right. But um, as soon as I found out we were doing Rick you Remender, have to do a formal I, proposal, Ashley. Yeah, I should you have put it in writing. Around the bush. Um, you made the it. business plan, all right? <laughs> What's the risk? There's a but template. Yeah, I'm I'll very, very, <laughs> very excited for this Remender episode. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started then. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Short Box Podcast. The Short Box Podcast is recorded live from Jacksonville, Florida. Yo, Short Box Nation. Welcome back to the podcast. How are we doing today? I hope you guys are in a great mood like I am. Uh, To all of our new friends joining us for the first time, my name is Botter. Welcome to the Short Box Podcast, a comic review and talk show where we provide you with the best conversations about comics, culture, and more. This is episode 369, and today we're adding another entry to our long-running Artist Spotlight series. But instead of spotlighting a traditional comic artist legend like we normally do, we're going to shine a bright spotlight on Rick Remender, one of the industry's most premier writers that is still crushing it today. 
Now, before you call blasphemy. Oh, my God. Or you start yelling at your kids or you, you know, <laughs> hit unsubscribe forever. Let me just say, all right, first and foremost, that it was all Ed's idea. All right. So please <laughs> send the angry emails to him. Um, I'll have his email in, in the show notes. You yeah, can bring write, it on. You can write your heads. <laughs> do something about it. <laughs> I'll have I'll, I'll have his address, you know, in the show notes. I'm getting doxxed. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Blame it on Ed. I kid, but only partially, and I'll let Ed explain his vision for this episode here in a few. But we're dedicating this Artist Spotlight episode to Rick Remender to not only switch things up a little bit, but we're also using this as an excuse to further celebrate a major milestone for one of our favorite comic publishers of all time, which would be Image Comics. This year marks 30 years of the company. And honestly, you can't help but mention Rick Remender when you consider the titles that he's released through the publisher and the success that he's not only found through Image but also the, the, the success and acclaim and fame that he's also brought to the publisher themselves. Uh, most of you know by now, if Remender's name is on a book, it's guaranteed to perk the ears of anyone that even remotely reads comics. And more than likely, it's probably going to be a hot seller. It's probably going to sell a lot of copies, if not sell out. Rick Remender is a man who has enjoyed a 20 plus year career in the industry, starting as an animator on movies like The Iron Giant. He's taught comics and storyboarding at prestigious art academies. He's worked as a writer for video game companies on games like Bulletstorm and Dead Space. And he's released dozens of genre-spanning and highly regarded original creator-owned titles like Deadly Class, which got a live-action adaptation through Hulu for the record, and he worked as a producer on that. He's released titles like Seven to Eternity, Black Science, and more. And I'd be failing my personal brand if I didn't mention... The guys work on Marvel titles like X-Force, Venom, and Punisher War Journal have been short box favorites since the day that we started this show. And he's the reason we even get to see Falcon take over the mantle of Captain America in the MCU. He came up with all of that. That is my long-winded way of saying we got a great episode lined up for you today. But before we go any further, let me introduce the rest of today's panel. Joining me for today's panel are the best co-hosts a guy like myself could ask for. And there are two people a lot of you have missed dearly. Calling in is everyone's mighty matriarch to be. Ashley Lanny Hoy is here with us. Oh. What up, Ashley? Hey, guys. How's it going? Matriarch to be. Matriarch to be. I, that yeah, was a good was nickname. Good. Yeah, Ashley, I like oh, that. <laughs> Thank you so much. See, I got, the, I got a cosign. I came right on this one. And sitting to my left, or camera right, for those of you watching the video version of this podcast, is the especial Edmund Dansart. What's up, Ed? What's up? Ed, do you care to explain yourself, young man? Suggesting a writer to be the topic of discussion for so, an artist spotlight series. <laughs> Explain yourself. So I know Ashley was kind of hitting around at this for a while. No, I'm just kidding. About it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you just wanted so, to beat her to the punch. I, <laughs> so I, I really wanted to do, since this is Image's 30th year um, publishing comics, I thought, you know, this is, this is a big deal, at least, you know, to me, because that's kind of one of my childhood, you know, favorite childhood memories in comic books is the the image launch so it's and i think we've pretty much covered the founders the majority of the founders we've covered in our artist spotlights over the years yep we've done a so, todd mcfarlane episode we did a jim lee episode this year yeah. we just did uh the savage dragon yeah you yep, know so true. and uh like i said i thought well we've kind of covered that initial so i figured let's do a little make it more contemporary and i figured they have a lot of really, you know, a hand, well, more than a handful, but there's a lot of, you know, great writers that have published several titles. So I figured let's go in the opposite direction and just kind of, you know, stretch, spread our wings a little bit, see if we can talk about some writers who've, who've been, you know, very important to this, like I said, the image renaissance of the, that mid 2000s. I love it. Yeah. When you came to me with that idea, I was all on board for it. I said, you know, I wish Ashley would have approached me with a business plan like this. But it totally <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm just messing. I'm just messing. But to be uh, absolutely transparent, much like all of our previous Artist Spotlight episodes, the subject of today's show was really selected by our Patreon subscribers. Ed simply proposed the idea and provided them a list of potential candidates and our patrons took care of the rest. All right. Remender ended up winning 45 percent of the votes. Wow. He beat out other great comic writers like Robert Kirkman and Jeff Lemire, which, you know, between just those two names, that's that's no small feat. I mean, you know, for him, I really thought we were going to be doing a Robert Kirkman episode, uh, but I was pleasantly surprised to see Remender get so much love and, and you know, win a majority of the votes. 
Um, Ashley, are, are you are you pretty are you bummed out that we didn't get to talk about your boy Jeff Lemire? You know what, Jeff Lemire we can save him is for a the artist writer. spotlight. If we do Jeff Lemire, we're going to do a writer spotlight, <laughs> not an artist spotlight. That's all I'm saying. I'm just happy to be talking about Rick Remender today. Same. Same. Ashley, you've got a glow, and it's just not the pregnancy glow. You've got oh, a glow to you right like now. It's an ethereal sunlight yeah. coming in. It is. Yeah, you're not, lighting in this video is nice. <laughs> wow. All right, Ashley, go ahead. I don't, we usually don't do it this late in the day. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing beats natural light for a video. I like it. <laughs> All right, and speaking of our Patreon subscribers, I've been waiting. I've been waiting for for the family to get back together, for you two to get back on the show. Before I announce this one, um, it's time that we welcome the newest member of our Patreon community, Ashley and Ed. Help me welcome the newest member. He goes by the name of Mac Jacobson. Oh, That's a good name, the Mac. Yeah, Mac Jacobson. Welcome to the Short Box Elite. You have made. The smartest financial mm-hmm. investment of your entire life, buddy. <laughs> All right. By signing up for the Patreon. Not only will your money help us keep the lights on, um, it'll keep me out of jail and, you know, my legs intact because I owe the mob a lot of money. Uh, and mob being Ben Kingsbury with Gotham City Limit Comic <laughs> Shop. <laughs> but you'll also get to dunk on the other 90% of our listeners who tune in free. All right. You're among the 10%. That's uh, I'd, I'd put that on a resume, okay? Matter of fact, that's that's one of the perks that we don't talk enough about when you become a short box Patreon subscriber. The fact that you put that on your resume, you're going places. You're about <laughs> to live a much happier life, Mac, knowing that you have our eternal gratitude. Um, we just made your life better, and you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, and if you're listening right now, like, damn, I. I want those accolades and privileges. I want to advance my lifestyle and, you know, be called one of, you know, their favorite, you know, listeners. I want to be in on the inner circle of short box life and I want early access to everything and bonus shows and merch. Well, listen up, you greedy little pig. Go ahead. Get out. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> huh. Easy. A little Alec too Baldwin. aggressive. A little too aggressive. Sorry. Sorry a little too aggressive. Like Alec Baldwin <laughs> talking to his daughter. Jeez. <laughs> All right, a little too aggressive. All right. Our Patreon is great, but maybe maybe it didn't warrant all of that. I apologize. I apologize. Just gets it's hyped. He's getting hyped. Yeah, you're right. You're right. See what I, I get I get so excited talking about the Patreon. If you're interested in joining our Patreon and getting those accolades and privileges, bust out your phone and become a member of sorry, yeah. Get on your phone and become a member of our Patreon community at patreon.com slash the short box or just click the link in the show notes. To quote my favorite TV life coach ever, it's easy as hell. Why are you making it complicated? It's easy. All right, he didn't say hell, but I added that for special effect. And he wasn't talking about Patreon. He was actually talking about college, which would benefit your life. But regardless, my point still stands. Joining our Patreon is affordable. It's easy. You'll get a bunch of rewards in return. Please check it out for yourself. And one last thing before we get started. One more shameless plug, and I promise we'll get to talking about Rick Remender. I have something to announce right here at the very top so everyone gets a fair shot at hearing it. It's major, so please listen up. If if the only thing you hear is the next few words I'm about to say and you learn nothing about this amazing comic writer, um, all right, I kind of don't blame you because this is pretty important too, all right? We are partnering up with Short Boxed. That's the app, all right, for a giveaway, which I think is the most appropriately named comic company for us to team up with ever, Short Boxed. I mean, come on. We're going to give one lucky person a pristine copy of a 9.8 CGC graded copy of Deadly Class Number 1. Last time I checked, that's like a $100 value, okay? Ashley almost came to my house and kicked me in the nuts to uh, take this book from me, all right? She was very upset that she can't technically join in on this raffle because it'd be conflict of interest. Um, so don't let her anger go in vain, Okay. We want you guys to join in on this raffle. I have pics of the the comic uh, posted on Instagram. But like Highlander rules state, there can only be one lucky short box fan that will win this comic. It's going to be free to enter this contest. You can get up to three raffle tickets in total. I have the rules posted in the show notes. Or you just keep an eye on the Instagram um, and find the post for more information. Employees of the short box are not eligible, (laughs) actually. I'm sorry. It's a great giveaway, especially for something free. I want to go ahead and thank uh, Crow and the entire short box team for being open to the idea and providing the comic for the giveaway. Oh, that's a cool name. That is a badass name. All right. When I when I met him, I was like, nah, I like you just for your name alone. But for those of you uh, that aren't familiar with Short Boxed, it is the app that is making it easier and safer to buy and sell graded comics online. Short Box is available on Short Boxed is available on iOS and Android. Please check them out and please enter in the contest. 
Shameless plugs out the way. I feel like the table is now set to talk about our main topic today, Rick Remender. I think it's definitely safe to say we personally aren't any strangers to Rick Remender, and it's probably just as safe to say that most of the people tuning in aren't either. So I want to know what was something new that both of you learned about the man that you didn't know prior to this? Ashley, take that first. Um, So I actually went through his, um, I mean, not the Marvel stuff, I'm going to be honest, but um, (laughs) I went through (laughs) all the stuff that he's written for companies other than Marvel, and I have read all of it. Actually, you don't have to keep saying that part. I feel like like you're targeting me or something. We figured you got that down. (laughs) Did you guys see um, the comic The Last Christmas that he created with Brian Poussain? Yes. I had no idea that existed. Yeah, me either. He said that's the last comic he's he he has drawn. I mean, it looks like fun. So I have I have something to do now. I'm going to track that down. That's awesome. And he did one uh, Bruce Campbell adaptation of the, is it the man with the screaming brain? He drew the adaptation for that as well, I believe. If this is Rick Remender cover art on nice what Jeff I just, oh, okay, I was about to say, I was just about to say, <laughs> damn, my man is channeling Jeff, he's like good like Jeff Darrow. <laughs> You know, and technically, you know, if we're talking Rick Remender and, you know, uh, my jokes about, um, you know, this being an artist spotlight and we're doing a writer, technically the guy is an artist. So, Ed, uh, you get extra points, all right? I, I, I take back the hate mail thing. Please don't send hate <laughs> mail to Ed, all right? He don't deserve it. Ed, what about you? Did you learn anything new about Rick Remender? I, I, like I said, I've only known Rick Remender as just through his work. So I had no idea anything about his, how old he was, what he looked like, anything personal. Like, I didn't know he had this crazy a background, especially like in animation and being like a storyboard artist and things like that. And it makes sense seeing his, the way his, you know, the way his books look, end up looking, you know, he's kind of a visual, he has like a really cool visual taste and he picks the right people for the projects too, you know? So, but yeah, I didn't know any of that stuff. His track record of picking like some of the best artists is is damn near untouchable. I got to say, like this dude's worked with some of the best. I mean, you know, Tony Moore, Jerome Pena, uh, Sean Murphy, Sean Murphy, uh, Bangle. And I'm sure I'm missing a, a few others, but just those four alone, I feel like, you know, it puts him as a contender. Yo, this is Botter. Sorry for interrupting this episode, but I'll keep it brief. I wanted to let you know about a massive sale we have going on over at the Short Box Store on all of our merchandise and apparel. That's theshortboxstore.bigcartel.com. You can now save 20% off your entire order using the discount code YO, Y-O-O. So if you've been waiting for the right time to finally buy that gauntlet snapback, or if you ever wanted to buy any of the shirts you see me wear on the podcast, well, now's your chance to get them for a steal. We still have a few sizes left of everything, but they won't last long and once they're gone they are gone and then i mentioned that all of our apparel is screen printed on high quality material none of that heat transfer or direct to garment stuff our shirts are some of the most comfortable ones you'll ever wear and the hats look even better in person so wear your support for the short box nation proudly knowing that you're going to look damn good doing it get to the shortboxstore.bigcartel.com as soon as you can and don't forget to use that discount code Yo, Y-O-O, to save 20% off your entire order. All of this information can be found in this episode's show notes if you want to get there faster. Thanks for not pressing fast forward. Now back to the show. He did team up with an artist. Ashley Lane Hoy? you guys know. Oh, Ashley Lane Hoy. Oh. oh. Hold up. Yeah, Come on. Um, hold up. That- hold up. I you're, know. There, I know. You're telling me there is a connection between you and Rick Remender. Let me see if I can reach it from where I am. Was this the anthology he did? He was yeah, of? so um Pop Gun Volume One. Oh. Holy shit. I remember that book. Yeah. Yeah. He did um Josh did a story with him in the book. Oh, that's awesome. That is super yeah. rad. So you're telling me all these jokes that we make about you being well connected in the industry. Man, it really is not a joke. It's six six degrees of Ashley. <laughs> he just everything just connects. I mean, it was it was weird, but it was did it Josh was Josh cool. do the uh, inking too, or did he just? Or he did, did he every. He did all the art, the color too. Okay. Yeah, he did the lettering and everything. Did, did Josh share anything about Rick Remender or working with him that we can share? No, so he was waiting on the script, and um, Rick Remender had the script that he's been working on. And he was like super excited about it, and Josh was waiting for it. 
And then the night that he was supposed to get the script, uh, Rick Remender's computer died. Like, he could not get the script. And instead of rewriting it, he just wrote another story for him the next day. Damn. This freestyled one said, fuck it. All yeah, right, here we literally go. was just like, here, I don't, you know. He actually lost the file? He lost computer? every, like he couldn't oh. get the computer. He could have eventually, I don't know if eventually he got it, but like to meet that debt, like he missed the deadline by a day, but he still got a story out. Imagine if that original story was deadly class. He's like, fuck. Oh, yeah. I wanted to see this <laughs> <sighs> He just forgot. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, that's what I wanted, right? Deadly class. Sorry, Josh. No royalties for you, buddy. <laughs> no! oh. What could have been? That's awesome. That is a great story. <laughs> wow. Damn. And they're doing a Fear Agent uh, show. Yeah. So it could have been mm-hmm. Fear Agent. Yeah. And actually, that was um, that was my kind of tidbit uh, that, I, that I learned. Um, I didn't know about his giant generator uh, company. The fact that um, it is like his home studio that houses all of his creator own stuff. Um, and, and I guess that's kind of his launching point in like company that he uses to pitch things like Deadly, the Deadly Class show. And um, another fun fact that I just learned that uh, Seth Rogen, David F. Sandberg, Matt Tolmack are supposedly taking on Rick Remender's fear agent for Amazon. So Rick Remender is a, he's a busy man. Like uh, Ed, to your point, um, that was, that was kind of eye opening for me. I know the guy from image and his Marvel stuff. And of course I knew about him being involved with the deadly class Hulu TV series, but the animation background, the video game background, um, and you know, the, the teaching background, it w- was all news to me. He might be, I mean, we've we've spotlighted a lot of like highly uh, successful comic artists. I, I guess we've done Jim Lee and Todd McFarlane. They're kind of upper echelon, but Rick Remender is up there. I think he's one of the most successful he has that, comic like, creators we've we've done. That kind of business acumen, yes, as well as we the go. creativity. And he, I've listened to interviews with him this last week, and he's like, you know, that's the thing I want to teach artists to do is to kind of basically know your worth your IP, your, your creation and how to monetize that and how to move your, whatever you're creating into different platforms and different avenues. So hmm. he's like really big on, on that part of the business. It says it's not just the creative part. You have to also navigate the, and it's hard. And he's like, it's hard. It's not easy. It's, it's, he was, he said he was like in poverty for years and this is doing it. I mean, that's not a lucrative industry, you know, it's, he was still, he had his own animation, like a little animation studio that was funded by Yahoo. Oh, wow. But he still was teaching on the side to pay bills, you know? Huh. So <laughs> it wasn't like, I'm sure it wasn't like nonstop work. You know, it was kind of like project by like a free, almost like a, probably like a freelance thing. So he knows how to hustle. That's an inspiration right there. And I think I gave a, a relatively good high level overview of his career at the beginning um, and, and the different hats and companies that he's been successful at. Did I miss anything like glaring or do you have anything like worth noting? The one cool thing that I you pretty much covered a lot of the stuff I was going to do, but it's like the working with the uh, Fox Studios. He's basically got to work with like, you know, Don Bluth when he, he was basically in Phoenix at the time. And basically he dropped out of school. He dropped out of college to become a animation assistant oh wow so and it was like enough to you know keep him going but he always kept going he like moved to um la to do the iron giant and then he ended up moving to san francisco which he loved and you can see that influence in deadly class Mm -hmm. um and then like i said it's uh he while in san francisco too he's kind of like a the you know west coast kind of pop punk guy so he did a lot of stuff for a fat records um which is a no effects you know, um, record label, <clears throat> independent record label. So he did a lot of punk rock records. So he has that kind of punk rock kind of ethos too. Like, and, uh, and you can, like I said, you can kind of see that San Francisco and that kind of punk rock stuff in that time frame. And, you know, deadly class, it's like a very kind of personal work for him. Um, just when he was spending his time there. Um, but yeah, like I said, taught at the Academy of art and he just kept moving, going and end up in Portland for a little bit. He just kept following the, following that dream and he actually when he he was actually in EA, working at EA doing the uh, when he was doing Dead Space and he was going to do a series of Simpsons games oh wow but then when but he was still doing like Fear Agent and this is like 2005 or 6 so he's still you know Fear Agents floating out there Strange Girls floating out there he has a handful of things Sea of Red so he's got some stuff that's starting to pick up steam and he basically said I can be either 
cubicle corporate guy, an EA, and be a lifer there, or I can do this full throttle being a writer. And he basically went away from the comfortable choice, the you know the the choice a lot of us would take because the security of it. And but basically, you're doing other people's stuff. You mm-hmm. know, you're being creative for other people. But he wanted to kind of strike out on his own, so he he basically you know a lone wolf and cub where he puts the knife in the ball, and baby. <laughs> which one you crawl into? If you've read it, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I feel like that was for me, Ed. I appreciate that. <laughs> Damn, that's that's really inspiring. And that's that wouldn't even become the first or last time he would make a decision like that. Because when he leaves Marvel in 2015, after eight very successful years there, like you know working on Venom and uncanny uh x-force and you know getting that acclaim and building his name he made the decision to leave marvel in 2015 and um actually found an article uh during that time uh, i think it was on ign where they announced that and he had wrote a, uh, i guess he had written a letter to the fans and, and whatnot and i really like what he wrote uh and i think it coincides with what, what you know you brought up as far as him like kind of carving his own path and following his gut and making like that hard decision. He gives a lot of praise, like thanks to Marvel. Like they helped me, you know, stay paid. I could afford a doctor bill for my, you know, a doctor visit for my kids. Mm -hmm. If anything should happen to them, it was very lucrative, but you know, essentially like it's my time to like, you know, go out on my own. And matter of fact, I've got it here. He says, quote, the writer penned a letter to himself. I'm sorry. Anytime a writer writes to themselves, you know, it's going to be just like (laughs) filled with quotables and it's like, make a movie Mm -hmm. out of this. Uh, But he wrote, quote, the unknown road holds better treasure, and even if it doesn't, you have to be true to yourself, to live independently or die and see what you can do on your own. Uh, end quote. Uh, article goes on. Years later, Remender is one again taking his own advice. Um, furthermore, quote, so for the next year, I'm only going to do work that the artists and I own, Remender said on his blog, putting my ass on the line along with my partners and try for the dream one more time, end quote. Mic drop. This is amazing. Truly amazing. Yeah. And this is a guy, too, that had a track record. So basically, too, even I read that article, um, but I, I listened to some interviews, too, like more recent interviews, and he was meticulous because there was a point to where he said, like, quote, he said, hat in hand, I went to Marvel, and I went there to build my audience. So Marvel. basically, it's like, I can do this. I can, I've reached kind of what I can do on my own. You know, and like I said, he's he's getting involved in comics when it's kind of on in its dark ages, mm. you know, the post crash comics era, especially with independent comics. So he's he's even said, you know, I went to Marvel. This is my goal. I'm going to do my do. He does, you know, excellent work there. And basically, I'm going to build my audience. And then when I go out on my own, I'm going to take those people with me. So it's everything he does is strategic, it's man. Strategic. It's 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 a gamble, but there's there we go. Better ma- there's a meticulous decision making there, and everything. It's not just a wild, you know. There's always he seems to be like a few steps ahead of everything. Can you have a strategic gamble, or is that like an oxymoron? Well, <laughs> nothing like that. <laughs> it's a gamble, but there's like there's a reason for it. It's not just a, a risk, an unnecessary risk, I should say. Well said. And we've talked a lot about like that strategy, right? When we look at some of the premier names um, at Image, you know, there's a lot of writers that you could point to that you're like, oh, they built, you know, they, I, I found out about them from their work on Marvel or DC. And then I followed along when they decided to do their own creator stuff. Matter of fact, we've talked a lot about the Image uh, Renaissance period that started around 2011, lasted about, you know, until 2014, 2015. Uh, primarily because we were all working at our you know respective comic shops, we were absorbing the culture from that retailer perspective and getting to see it firsthand. In addition to just being you know fucking fans, but um, I think we've all agreed at some point that it was an incredible time to be buying like Image Comics, right? Because we were getting an influx of like brand new creator owned comics, and it felt like every month was a brand new number mm-hmm. one that you just you know that had so much excitement for it. You know, some of the best creators in the industry. We're at uh, Image at that time, as well as like rising talent. You know, we saw the debut of Saga by Brian K. Vaughn and Fiona Staples, East of West by Hickman and and Nick Dragata, someone else who was doing like the same play, right? Like build my audience at Marvel, bring them over at Image. Uh, Brew Baker and Phillips had put out Fatal around that year. And in 2013, we saw Image publish not one, but two brand new series uh, by Remender. In 2013, Deadly Class debuted, as well as Black Science, along artists Wes Craig and Nick Dragata, respectively. Um, and I say all that to, to ask, to give this to you, Ashley. 
Um, if you'll do us a favor and take us down like memory lane <laughs> and, and tell us, what do you remember about that image renaissance period? Specifically, uh, your reaction or maybe like the customer reactions to Rick Remender. That was, um, I mean, that was just a really exciting time to work in a comic shop because every time somebody asked you what you were reading or what you would recommend, like just, I would just feel so happy. I'm here. I'm come, <laughs> let me come show you this. Let me come show you my image bookshelf. Um, cause they had the, I don't know if they still do them, but the nine ninety nine number one trade paperbacks. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you would just, you know, bring people over and be like, oh, so you like to read Wolverine? Well, maybe you'll like Deadly Class or Southern Bastards. Um, yeah. Even those dollar like firsts, X-Men. the image dollar firsts. Yeah, yeah. Those are great. Um, And you would kind of like, oh, you like X-Men? Here, try East of West. Or um, like you like Suicide Squad? Here, I've got Rat Queens for you. Um, It was just really awesome to have like to just share it with people and just be like, here, look, like you don't know what you want here. Here's a saga number one trade paperback or a deadly class number one trade paperback. Like you will like this. Yeah. Especially you can get the people who aren't interested in superhero stuff, which I love. I'm yeah. not, we're not, I'm not, we're not disparaging that stuff. Cause that's awesome. But you get the folks who want, it's like, man, I want to read it, but I'm not really into the superhero thing. That's not my thing. Image is where we go, you know, could name like a dozen like you just named a half a dozen or more titles that I, I that I would recommend as well you know like shorter titles like if somebody was just looking to grab something they weren't looking to be on an ongoing title like there was um I don't remember what year Tokyo Ghost came out but that was one and like The Wake like they had super awesome stuff to read um that you could just be like, here, this is the whole thing right here. This is all you need. You don't have to come back if you don't want to. Yeah. Ashley, were you familiar with um with Rick Remender prior to uh like Deadly Class and Black Science? Like were you were you aware of him like when he was doing like, you know, Uncanny X Force and the Marvel stuff? Or was like his image work your first kind of, of conscious exposure? It was it was definitely the image stuff because I have to say like when I was in, you know, middle school, high school reading X-Men. It wasn't for the writer. It wasn't for the artist. It was just because it was X-Men. Um, and then as I, you know, went to college and got out of college, that's when I started following stuff for the writers or the artists. What was the title or body of work that won you over for Rick Remender? I would have to say it was it was Deadly Class because I think after I started reading that, everything that had his name on it, does your gateway that was look. an image title yeah. i started grabbing <laughs> yeah yeah i think for me it was definitely uncanny x-force was my first conscious like first time really diving into his work and you know if, if you go back to you know episode one or two or three of of you know the podcast you will hear me walt and drew like hyping it up every month and every week that it was coming out and i think it's safe to say rick remender was maybe one of the first writers that I consciously like followed over into his creator own body of work because he had just won me over with his writing. You know, he he was killing of Uncanny X Force. Um, I I remember like friends loving his Venom stuff, um, and it was like, yo, this dude can do no wrong. And then he he goes to he leaves Marvel, goes to Image, and I loved Black Science. Like Black Science yeah. was my shit, man. <laughs> um, yeah, and and I think it's you know, and he was also like a writer that me drew. And Walt bonded over um, when we started the show because he was like, it's probably safe to say he was our favorite writer uh, when we first started the show during that image renaissance. It was like Rick Remender's name is on a book. You got to at least pick up issue one. I think I've tried every single Rick Remender book up to like Wake. I think after Wake, I kind of became a little spotty and, you know, I fell off a lot. But Rick Remender was uh, that that to me is like in this house, he's a goddamn household name All right, in the Milligan house. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in addition to taking an unorthodox, quote unquote, unorthodox approach to this artist spotlight installment, I wanted to ensure that we covered as much ground as possible when it comes to Mr. Remender. As you guys can tell, I mean, his career, it, it spans a lot of years. It spans a lot of titles, books, companies and all that. And I still wanted us to celebrate this year solidifying 30 years of image comics in the industry. So I gave everyone I gave us the task of each uh, picking one of his comics published through Image to read and report on. Um, And since I chose X-Factor, I'll go last. Ed, (laughs) how about you go ahead and kick us off? 
All right, I chose. It's not my first thing I've read of his, but I picked it because it's the first. It's his first credited solo writing comic. It's called a Doll and Creature. Have you seen this, Ashley? No, I haven't. So basically, this came out. I believe I want to say originally it was a black and white comic, um, and it was published by. I never know how to say the name of this company. AIT Planet Lair. Uh, it's like a small kind of. I think a black and white publisher, and then. An image, basically, he kind of remastered the series, like a four-issue series and a collection and then added a, an epilogue to it. But basically, it's a – I picked it because this is kind of like his first book as a solo writer, not writing or collaborating with anybody. And uh, basically, it's like a Frankenstein monster. It's a monster book. It's kind of a – it's almost like, a, I guess, contemporary comparison. If you like The Goon, you'd probably like this. Hmm. It's kind of set in this world that it's uh it's basically where like religion organized religion is banned and then kind of the subculture what you'd consider subculture is a status quo so everyone kind of is like goth and dresses up like monsters and stuff and there's like a uh a designer drug um called gray matter that turns people into like a almost like a mr hyde type characters like these hulking beasts and you know and it's it's a playoff of the frankenstein's monster on the surface level it's like a fun hmm you know, monster book with, you know, sexy lady, Frankenstein monster. But there's a lot of crazy themes in here if you look deeper into it. And I think it's one of the things I like about him is you can enjoy it as a surface level and it's not too preachy. If you dig deeper into it, it's like, oh, wow, he's he's doing some serious stuff in here, which he will explore later. And it's kind of like I like this because I can kind of see these are the the seeds of the, the uh, Franken castle because yeah, yeah. if you look at them it's like this looks like frank castle it's like a james dean frankenstein with crazy sideburns pompadour <laughs> um and then and the religious aspect of it you can kind of go into where you go into the strange girl series which is the first thing i've read from him but it's a fun you know, it's, it's a fun book it's it is like a it's a pretty much four issue pure action but there's like a lot of themes like a religion of course um how we deal with addiction because of this drug like basically there's these hard liners that's like this drug once you're addicted you can't be cured so is addiction a disease or is addiction a choice so it, it covers that but there's this great monster candy coating on it so this pill is really easy to swallow when you're reading it so like so that's why i picked it and like i said it's one story arc it's a it's it's pretty fun. It doesn't get bleak unless you really dig into it. <laughs> and like I said, it's it's a cool thing to kind of see where this is the starting point. This is like the origin, you know, and then you can kind of see this influencing a lot of his other stuff. That is an excellent pick. All right, Ashley, I'm taking it to you. What was your pick? Um, so I just I went ahead. I know I've talked about this book probably every other episode, um, <laughs> but I had to go with Deadly Class. Oh, um, cause it's, it's wrapping up and it kind of feels like, uh, like the end of like an era in my life, just because I've been reading this since I was like working at the comic shop. And now I'm about to like, I'm about to go into like this new part of my life and like deadly class is wrapping up and I'm like, oh my God, am I like getting old now? You know what I mean? You got yeah. your assassination degree from the school yeah i feel like this was like the book the comic book of like my golden years and now i'm going on to my parent years <laughs> actually that is so well said that's almost like poetic mm -hmm. like said that you grew up with with deadly class i mean deadly class came out 2012 i mean what we were i mean you were a pretty close in age we were probably what like early 20s maybe like you know kids. very yeah yep. yeah exactly kids and to Not think a care that, in the world <laughs> yeah and to think <laughs> Yeah, we were kids, and now you're about to have your own kid, right? Like, that is really well said. Um, yeah, Rick Remender, I guess, is a lot of his comics have been, like, the, I, I guess, whatever the comic equivalent of, like, the soundtrack to certain, like, you know, points in your life. Like, his books have been have been there, like, uh, throughout my, like, you know, me becoming an adult. Yeah, and it's funny because it parallels because that book almost feels like a, I'm, yeah, I don't think he's an story. assassin, went to an assassin school mm. under Chinatown by any means, <laughs> but you can, I can feel like this is him growing up. This is like kind of like his time in San Francisco. You can see this is a very personal book, you know. For those that might not be familiar with Deadly Class, tell us about it. What, what's it about? So it's about um, 
It's around the uh, freshman class at a school called King's Dominion, which is for assassins. And so you've got kids from like mafia, Yakuza, like big gangs that are sending their kids there to learn. You also have like homeless kids, like street rat kids that have no other choice. Um, That's where Marcus, the main character, comes in. And you really do like you feel like you've known this person their whole lives because Mm. as the book goes, he ages you know, it, it goes through time and um, it's just like none of these characters are perfect. And uh, Rick Remender has this knack for making you really, really fall in love with someone and then he kills them. And so <laughs> it's kind of like it's really hard to, you know, get attached because you don't know what's going to happen. Um, but with this, like you have no choice. Yeah, he does a great job of, at least, especially in Deadly Class, like introducing you to the stakes very early on. Because I remember like reading like mm-hmm. th- those first couple of issues and growing kind of like fond of certain characters. And it's like, wait a minute, D- did he just kill off like my favorite character? <laughs> and just feeling devastated and like even mad to the point. It's like, I'm not reading this shit anymore, right? I'm not getting my heart <laughs> broken every weekend, week out. I don't know what to trust. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah that- he completely like ruins you and then he comes in and he's like oh well here's like here's helmet like here how can you not fall in love with this guy and you're like yeah you're right man (laughs) i'll keep reading i think he does a um i feel like a lot of his stories usually focus on a very um like uh, a a relatable uh uh protagonist who is going through a rough point in their life that's like really having to like get it through the mud to like get out of their situation. Like they're, they're never really perfect, pristine characters, right? They're not, they're sometimes they're like more so like, they're never like black and white characters. They're, there's always, they're, they're always perfect, the but they're yeah. likable. There's a likability yeah. to them. Yeah. Even scumbag. <laughs> I mean, Oh God, really? <laughs> that's the worst, but he's, there's a charm to that character that, and I think what's crazy and I'm not, I don't want to, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but, like I said, just realizing that he's been in this game so long. And I think that's Scumbag is becoming like his best selling book. Scumbag, to, to add to that, Scumbag mm-hmm. is his best number one selling comic through Image. And he's been there for 16 years. And that was just yeah. last year is when Scumbag number one debuted, which, you know, we're talking about Rick Remender. You could, we could literally do a three part series, like early Remender, mid year Remender, Remender now, and he'd still be like, we'd still be praising him. But yeah, he just had a, a, his best number one selling. So it's like that consistency and just like he still yeah. has it, you know? <laughs> he's, not, he's not just doing a template. Okay, I'll just do this. He's really, really still being very creative and very high level this far along in his career. Deadly Class is also the reason. I think I was introduced to Wes Craig. Is is that a safe bet for anyone else? Was anyone else aware of Wes Craig prior to Deadly Class? I don't think I was. I wasn't. Yeah, it's sharp, super style. I love that style. Rick Rem- I mean, we talked a little bit about it um, in the beginning, but his eye and his his choice of artists, uh, man, that dude has got such uh, such a good eye for art. And I mean, it obviously comes from his own, you know, uh, animation and art background, yeah. but. Uh, I mean, without Rick Remender, I probably wouldn't have, you know, known Wes Craig as soon as I did or or like I know him or Jerome yeah. Opinion. And, and I've, like I said, I've been listening to some interviews with him and he's, that's, he, he says, you know, he's always looking at artists and artwork and, you know, thinking of future things. Like the guy who even did the Doll and Creature book, John Hebick, he was a animation guy and he was also, I think, probably a fellow professor at the school. And I think some of his students, he's... He's um he's given jobs to, so and he's he's said it's like I want someone who's, necess- you know it's it's like I'll work with bigger names but I want someone who's hungry, and he said that even though he's an artist he keeps everything pretty amorphous in general and then basically they go back and forth and they do the characters so it's like it's like I'm not just using an artist to, like you know boost my ego I'm you know we're we're this is a, a true collaboration that's cool mm-hmm. Ashley have you read all of um. Have you, are you like fully caught up on Deadly Class? I know it's like ending this is ending like this year, right? Like in a few issues. Yeah, it's getting close. I have um the last series arc is called uh, Fond Farewell, and um, I'm a little bit behind just because I'm saving them. I like I, I don't want it to end. I really don't. Uh, I'm right there with you. One of the articles I shared, I think, had a lot of um like panels and and previews of like this last 
deadly class story arc and i just had to start reading the the i just had to start reading the the article because deadly class much like saga and the more i think about it a lot of those number ones and series that, that came out of that image renaissance you know hearing us talk about growing up with a comic series or a writer kind of being like you know the soundtrack to certain points in your life Deadly Class and Saga are both comics that I kind of just fell off just because of like, just getting older, getting busy, like, you know, not buying as many comics. But recently, I've had a fondness and, and kind of like yearning to go back to them. And Deadly Class being very high up there, just kind of thinking about like, damn, that was such a good point in my life when that came out. You know, all the books were great. I was really like experimenting and trying like new comics and stuff. Um yeah, like uh, hearing you talk about Deadly Class and saying that has got me thinking about reading, yeah. getting caught up myself. I got, I think, the first four trades. Uh, definitely, once it wraps up, I'm getting the rest of them. Thank you, Ashley. All right, so the series that I picked, I went with, and I joked at the beginning, of course. It was a, it was a very bad joke about me picking just Marvel's. I didn't get it. It's like, he's really Thanks. doing X-Force? <laughs> All right. I, I was a little mad, too. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> You're like, this motherfucker right here said we could only pick his image He's like, stuff. oh, that didn't come across as a joke? It's like, no. No, not at all. <laughs> so I decided to go with Fear Agent, which I thought was I've always I guess you know I've been wrong this whole time, but I thought that was his first um like breakthrough and an image thing. I think it might be safe to say it was one of the earliest maybe breakthrough things that that's he had. His first I guess hit. If okay, you want to that's, say that. that's yeah. fair. But Fear Agent is a title that you know someone like Drew has praised and and read highly. I mean, even our, our boy Adam Wallet. I think he was one of the first people like I met that you know was on Rick Remender early. He loved Fear Agent, talked about it a lot. I just never really got into it. Um, so I used, you know, this episode as an opportunity to dive into that and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, you know, for those uh, curious about it, Fear Agent uh, revolves around an alien exterminator named Heath Hust Houston. I think that's how you say it. Yeah, Heath Houston, um, who stumbles upon an extraterrestrial plot uh, to commit genocide against the human species. Uh, that sets him on a course to where he's got a, um, he's got like an alcoholic problem. So he's got to put down the bottle and he's got to resume his role as a peacekeeper. Um, and they're known as the fear agents in this particular um, universe. Same thing that we kind of talked about, a character that's really kind of down on their luck. That's kind of like jaded due to like things that hasn't been quite described yet. Uh, they talk about like his past and, and um, later issues. But in the beginning, you're just kind of like, damn, this dude's kind of rough around the edges. You know, like, you know, if there was a, a peacekeeping, a space keeping task force. He'd be the last guy you'd want on your team. Um but the series premiered in 2005, first as an Ashcan comic through Image Comics. Um, it was published by Image initially from 2005 for like a year, and then it moved to Dark Horse for like from 2007 to 2018, and then I guess it got back to transition back to Image in 2018 or, or uh, yeah, in 2018. And it says that it's still currently there, but I think the last issue came out like years ago, so I was a little confused by that. It's kind of bounced around a little bit. But I've been reading out in Comixology because they've got like the first trade for free and you can find all of the trades pretty easy. Um, it's also got a rotating cast of artists and frequent collaborators that, you know, he would go on to work with. But he starts off the series of Tony Moore of Walking Dead fame. But seeing Tony Moore's artwork in this colorized at that, because I've only been exposed to like, you know, black and white uh, uh, Walking Dead and it's pretty fucking solid. But Tony Moore's artwork in this is super good. Um, he does like a, a stint with uh, Tony Moore. Jerome Pena hops on uh, art duties at some point. But what I'll say about Rick Remender's writing style, just looking at this specifically, and I think you know you can kind of see this element in a lot of his writings, is he's got a knack for also developing an atmosphere. Like there's a certain atmosphere and attitude to hit the, like the worlds he builds, and I think he's a really good world builder because he sets out like the scene, like. You know, uh, you feel like it feels lived in. I think that's the phrase I'm thinking about. When you read any of his comics, you're like, man, this world has been through some shit. It's been around a while. It feels like it's gone through like events and it's got a timeline of its own. And that's what I really like. Like you think about uh, something like um, I think like low. I'll admit I, I didn't read a lot of low, but I know it took place like underwater and stuff. And, you know, for him to jump to that have something like that under his belt, something like Deadly Class, which is based on like fucking San Francisco, Cali, um, you know, West Coast vibes. And you got Fear Agent, which is like outer space. Like he's really good at diversifying the genres he writes and, and like nailing it. How much of it did you read? I read uh, through f uh, four issues. Okay. Like I'm, I'm, I'm almost done with the first volume and I'm going to wrap up the first volume. 
I think that was probably like the next thing I got from him, you know, and I was like, this was pretty incredible. Cause like I said, and, and like I said, I'm not going to spoil anything, but you're just getting a warm up because the series gets pretty crazy. There's a lot of time paradox things, a lot of split universe things, and it has probably one of the most rewarding endings. I was listening to him. He's basically said he kept writing this ending down. He said, I'm going to keep writing it until. I start crying. I'm going to write it till oh, I'm in tears. And it is a tear jerking <laughs> ending. It's, yeah. it's, um, like I said, I don't want to spoil it, but it, no. there's a sense of, cause the first volume is good at kind of the world building, but then you always get this sense of kind of dread. Like if this is not going to, nothing's going to work. Nothing, you know, everything that he plans, everything he tries to do to change how things happened. There's like parts where he tries to go, back and prevent the initial invasion that got him sent out and everything always backfires him so when you read it it's like what's gonna go wrong now you know <laughs> ashley brought it up a little bit but remender takes you through the ringer man yeah a word that comes to mind is rewarding he is a very rewarding writer if you stick with his series and it's not really hard to like you know stick with it but like he rewards you as a reader like constantly you know like he's not like a he's not like a. am only gonna write one trade and then i'm gonna bounce to this next title like he does a really good like what deadly class is up to what 55 issues if i'm not mistaken i think fear agent ran mm -hmm. for like 30 issues uh i think black science ran for a long like he sticks to his properties and and gives it ch a chance to like really grow and you feel invested yeah this is one quote he's like he says half my work deals with the fact that I'm a depressive nihilist. <laughs> Everything is going to end up in flames. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. Said. That makes sense. But that series for me, and like I said, I have to go back and reread, you know, Deadly Class, but The Fear Agent I like too because it has that aesthetic of like kind of a retro sci-fi, like the rocket ships are kind of old timey, you know, like 60s yeah. style, 50s style sci-fi. But then, yeah, it, it, I definitely, if you want to, I definitely recommend recommend finishing it out because it really yeah like i said it's a very rewarding end the alien populace is is great too i, yeah. I think maybe that <laughs> i can split the credit between uh remender and tony moore just give it all to tony moore but the aliens that um the diversification of yeah. alien life forms in this comic <laughs> are really cool so we've talked about like rick remender's had his hand in a lot of titles a lot of creator owned stuff you know knowing what you know about how rick remender writes you know, like how he's influenced you and, and, you know, his work has resonated with you. Is there a particular series or title that you would love to see him write? Like if you could make a dream, you know, a dream sheet and, you know, give it to him. Like whether it be a character you've always wanted to see him write, a certain property or a genre, whatever it may be, like what would be your dream series for him to write? And it looks like both of you got your thinking cap on. So I'll share mine to go to kick us off. And I'm going to say Batman. I feel like it's, I don't. I couldn't find if he's already done any Batman work. I don't know if he's done any DC work, has he? he? Probably not, because he was Marvel exclusive yeah. when for those eight years, and then he went to Image. And I don't see him maybe ever going back to working Corporate, for one of the big yeah. two, because he's very like, he, I want to own my shit, and I respect that. I know I'm quoting him a lot, but he said like he was. They were talking about creator own stuff, and then like he's talking about how Vertigo kind of paved that way. And he said, but yeah, Warner Brothers still has their fingers up your ass. So I don't know if he's going <laughs> I don't know if he's going back. I, I got to hear these the, interviews. I, I think I'd he's like He's hilarious. Him. He's very he's very sarcastic, very fun interview for sure. The only thing I could find in regards to Batman and Rick Remender is that during quarantine, he posted like a bunch of his rejected pitches from Marvel and DC Comics. And one pitch that he had was for a Batman story. That would uh, where he would be facing a legion of zombified henchmen, and it was titled. Uh, the story was titled "Tuesday in Gotham," and I'm just going to read the the. Or I'm going to read just from the article. But the series would have seen Batman come face to face with an aspiring supervillain named the Cannibal, uh, who comes in a pos possession of a vial of the Joker serum, which even the clown prince of crime himself was too afraid to use. This serum would transform his victims into flesh eating undead. And a dark knight would have to would be in the for the fight of his life. Um, yo, I'm, I mean, sign me up. Does I feel Scott like Snyder to steal that <laughs> from that Black Knight, Dark Knight metal. But thinking about like the type of atmosphere and and world that uh, Rick Remender is able to build, and you know, giving you that very lived in uh, feel to it, I think it would translate for like Batman and Gotham City really well. So that'd be my my kind of dream pick. 
Um, Ashley, what about you? Um, see, I don't know. Like, I love his creator owned stuff so much that I wouldn't want to like put him in a box with something. But I will say, um, if you could have just maybe we could give him that last season of Game of Thrones. <laughs> oh, just to like, that's good. That's <laughs> let him is. wrap it up. <laughs> like, let him do his take on it. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> he is an accomplished fucking TV writer. That yeah. is, that's a good pick, Ashley. <laughs> Thinking outside the box. I like it. All right, Ed, what about you? Uh, I would probably go with more uh, monster stuff. So I'll probably go s- Swamp Thing. I'll stay in the DC universe. Him doing a Swamp Thing, the Swamp Thing series would be pretty cool. And almost keeping it like the kind of that Alan Moore style, where it's like a bunch of short stories that Swamp Thing's kind of tangentially involved in. Mm, yeah. You know, <laughs> something like that I think would be cool. Like it'll give him that freedom to really extend those like horror chops. Yeah, that'd be rad. So it sounds like we just need to, to convince him to do some DC stuff, man. That'd be that'd be super cool. In closing, I want to hear from both of you parting words, last words about Remender, specifically like what words come to mind when you think about like his career or or what stamp has he left on the industry so far? And if you've got any recommendations outside of the uh, uh, picks that you already shared, feel free to do that too. Uh, Ed, how about you going to Kickstarter? Oh man, like I said, it's just when we finally got the decision to do Rick Remender and I've been reading him for a while, but then when I was going back and looking through when we were picking our, you know, what we're going to do is like, I got a lot of this dude's stuff. Yeah. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, <laughs> I got so much of this guy's stuff and I don't know anything about the guy, you know, I don't know anything <laughs> about the dude except his name <laughs> <laughs> and maybe half of what he's done. Like one of the common things I I've seen just in, you know, just, I think in him being an artist, every title that I've seen him do has, and you know, it's like he, he's scouting these guys, but they're all visually interesting. So he's like a guy, like once I kind of put the name to some titles and started, like what you said, Ashley, when we kind of stop following characters and start following artists and writers and creative people. And we just like, Oh, I just want to do X-Men only. You know, we start putting names and faces to the people who, create our favorite versions of what we like growing up. Um, but everything he's done has a cool, has such a unique visual look to them as far as like, even like character designs and worlds. And they're so different. Like he'll do, there's half a dozen science fiction stuff, but they all look completely different, you know, aesthetically, um, of course, story wise, but everything just is, I don't know. It just, everything is always, looks interesting to me because I'll pick up, there's some people that I'll pick up like art, like writers. And it's like, if the art's not there, eh, I'll I'll pass it. But I don't think there's, I've always picked up a a Rick Remender, a new number one, you know, I don't think there was a time I, there was a Rick Remender book that came out where I didn't get it. I was like, I'll pass on this. I always got a number one Mm -hmm. from him. I'm out of my head. (laughs) Yeah. Well said. (laughs) Ashley, what about you? Like Ed said, he has a definite eye for artists. Um, I also, I don't think anyone writes like uh, a character just in that self-preservation mode like he does. The way that he writes comics, I'm like, I think that we would get along. Like, I feel like this person sees the world the way that I see the world. And I did just want to mention... He- <laughs> he had um this it wasn't she a contest but he was like school. oh yeah <laughs> is that it actually? he was like um he had people submit artwork of like his characters ed i don't know if you remember that it was like in the mm-hmm. back of some of his books he's like hey send me your oh. artwork and i'll print it um and he he printed some of my artwork it was oh, in the back nice. of like oh. Deadly Class, Low, um, Tokyo Ghost, literally like he printed it in like five or six of his books. Nice. And I felt like a little kid. Like literally, I was like buying multiple copies. I was like <laughs> keeping them in my purse. I was like, hey, look at this. Like I'm I'm in an image book. My buddy and, Rick posted um, my picture. <laughs> just that he did something out. like that. Like really, I mean, I'm still talking about it. And it happens like at least eight or nine years ago. <laughs> Ashley. Yeah, look. You won this episode. You absolutely, from the stories, <laughs> the, the review, yeah, the you know words. The I mean, look, and also your, your homework assignment. You cannot, leave, uh, you cannot leave the studio today until you send me. Um, can you find like the, the, the photo and your artwork that you sent in? 
I want to use it for the image. Yeah, um, I have it. Oh, for sure. I have it. Yeah. Let's use it for the um, episode artwork. So if you're listening to this episode and you're curious about the episode artwork. You did a Tokyo Ghost? It was Tokyo Ghost. Yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah, for sure. All right. Nice. There you go. That is the credit right there. That is who uh, illustrated today's episode artwork. Um, Well said, Ashley. And I kind of wish I would have went ahead of you because now I got to follow up to that. (laughs) <laughs> the only thing I'll say about Rick Remender that you guys haven't said, I mean, there's really not much more to be said that we haven't already said, but he is is definitely someone that has carved out his own path by following his gut. Uh, his his belief in his craft is is definitely very apparent. I, I get a very confident, um, you know, confident, but also someone willing to take, you know, some maybe shaky gambles. And the fact that he's left behind, you know, uh, not left behind, but the fact that he's decided to carve out his own path in face of like very secure um, opportunities is definitely inspiring, man. Like just the fact that he's a fearless individual and he's like a legit student and master of the craft. I think at this point, you know, like it's safe to say he is a master like at the craft. He's put in, you know, well over 10,000 uh, 10, hours. And I loved like, you know, reading that that thing that I shared where it, he was like, look, I'm going to put my ass on the line and, you know, put up and shut up. Like, I'm going to own these things. I love that he came to that realization. Like, I can benefit from doing my own stuff. So he's, he's inspiring, man. Like, he's definitely a writer that I think if you are new to comics or trying to find your way in, um, I think what Ashley and Ed have been sharing about, you know, following, you know, creators and, and learning to, you know, who your favorite creator is and what their styles are and going that route. I think Remender is a safe bet for anyone. Yeah. Like, he's got, like I said, mm-hmm. he's he's definitely inspiring to listen to because he's, he's, you know, he's basically saying you can do this. You need the drive, you know, the work ethic and, then, you know, a little bit of luck, of course. But, you know, like I said, he's very, like I said, he has a really strong work ethic just by listening to him. And I'll go ahead and throw in another recommendation. So we've, you know, uh, Ashley has talked highly of Deadly Class. Ed shared great things of, is it Creature, Doll and Creature. creature. Fear Agent was awesome. I'll throw in a a recommendation for Black Science, you know, which was one of my favorite uh, Rick Remender titles coming out during like that image renaissance period. You know, if if you're a fan of like Fantastic Four or stories about like broken families trying to find their way and and mending each other and and love sci-fi, like it, it's right up there, and there's enough comics in there that it, it'll last you a while. And I'll, I guess, like if I, if you don't mind, I will piggyback on that. I will recommend if you want like a short and sweet and beautiful comic, Tokyo Ghost is oh. incredible. Like I said, it's like a Blade Runner with very Japanese overtones. It's just a really unique looking book, and like I said, it's another um story about addiction and uh like i said it's but like i said sean murphy doing the artwork that is i remember when that book was announced and losing my shit like you're telling me rick remender and sean gordon murphy are (laughs) gonna be on he's been like you gotta be what using that middle name he's adding that middle name (laughs) (laughs) yeah that was insane yeah tokyo ghost is that was something else. Yeah, man. Rick Remender, a lot of good memories attached to Rick Remender and like all of his titles. I'm I'm glad but I'm glad that we we did a spotlight on him. And if you were to ask me, I, I feel confident that I could share this episode of Remender himself, and I think he'd give us a thumbs up like Mike and Laura Albert did. So with that being said, I think we covered as much as we could for today's intent and purposes. But I hope we at least got the point across that this man has had a rich career in comics. He's put himself out there time after time to follow his passion. And his dreams, and as you can tell, he's reminded us the power, potential, and excitement of good storytelling. So if you feel like we missed anything, if you're like a Rick Remender diehard and you're screaming at your phone like, how could they not talk about XYZ? Remember, we were only going to cover the image stuff. We could do a whole (laughs) separate episode about the Marvel (laughs) stuff, uh, but we'd love for you to chime into the conversation. Feel free to hit us up on Instagram, Twitter, or email. And if you're new to the show and you enjoyed this spotlight and you're like, damn, I want more stuff like this, check out our, our other Artist Spotlight episodes like the one we did about Mike and Laura Alred back in episode 359. That one was so good. Mike Alred uh, mm. wrote us and said he loved it. So, I mean, you can't go wrong with these Artist Spotlight episodes. Um, Actually, just yawned, which I think is a perfect uh, cue. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we were kind of like long in the tooth about Rick Remender, but he, he deserves it, right? But I think it's a perfect time to take a quick break before we read some fan mail and champion this week's entertainment picks. Um, Normally, we'd be doing our Fistful of Comics segment brought to us by Gotham City Limit Comic Shop, but we're recording this episode on Batman Day. 
And as you can imagine, for a shop called Gotham City Limit, Ben and his team are busy as hell today, so he wasn't able to send in his top three comic picks. We'll share that next week. We'll be back to normal then. Um, But in the meantime, here's some music for you to enjoy while we go stretch our legs. We'll be right back. We are back. The music you just heard was by our good friend, DJ Crumbs. Do me a favor. Give that guy a follow on Instagram. All right. I got a link in the show notes uh, for more of his music. And he does artwork, too. So check that out. Now, we're getting into uh, the fan mail segment. We've actually only got one piece of fan mail to read today. And this was sent to us by our guy, T-Mix. All right. One of our favorite active listeners, he actually sent this. Um, he, he sent this email about a month ago oh. um, when we announced the Green Lantern comic giveaway. So obviously he's automatically going to win that one. Um, but I'm just now <laughs> getting to it because um, I like to read the emails uh, for episodes like this when you guys are on the show and and whatnot. So my apologies, T Mix. I know you've been waiting on us to to read this email, but we're going to get into that right now. Right? All right. All right. Let me pull up his email. Do 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 do. T Mix. It's been a minute. I got to go to the search bar to find T Mix's email. Here's the email. It is titled "Dream a Little Dream." T Mix writes, "You, what up, short box? First, great job, Ashley, on your Spanish pronunciations. Much better than oh, Potter. nice. <laughs> I was hoping he would say that. Honestly, <laughs> though, let's be honest. With how much trouble Botter has pronouncing English, I'm not surprised." <laughs> Speaking of, I loved Sandman on Netflix, but I was annoyed at how they were pronouncing Constantine. It's the small things. I'm sure I just pronounced that wrong, too. It's like Constantine, right? Uh, no, I think in the show they say Constantine. I think it's Constantine. I think it's what we're all familiar with. Anyways, he goes on to write, Episode 6, The Sound of Her Wings, was my favorite, but I'll keep it spoiler-free. I've got two champions this week. First is my... First is my high school friend's new podcast that I think is a fantastic compliment to the short box. It's called Beep. No, I kid. Uh, The name of the podcast (laughs) is The Multiverse of Toys. (laughs) It is a pop culture podcast based out of Orlando area that focuses primarily on the toy collecting side of comics. They're 26 episodes to date, so they're pretty new, but I thought you guys might enjoy. That actually sounds really cool. I I would love to um, uh, hear a podcast about the toy side of comics. All right, but the email continues... My second champion is a documentary on HBO called Milestone Generations. It is a very well done story about the comic creators that answer the question, where are the black superheroes? As well as the birth of the Dakotaverse. I legit thought Static Shock was just a spinoff show from Justice League series first. Talk about having your mind blown. Yeah, it's a great doc. I highly recommend that. All right, and then he wraps up. All right, time for the prompt. Though I already picked up a copy of Jason Todd's first appearance as Green Lantern because Ben sold me. So which is the image OG? Oh, which of the image OG was my favorite? Okay, I, I, th- I think the prompt was tell us about what was your favorite original uh, image comic series. It's coming back to me. Mm. Uh, he writes, well, to be honest, I never read any of them until last week when I did a speed read through volume of uh, speed read through of the volume one of the OGs. Like Ashley kept saying, I had to remember these were written in the 90s. <laughs> my pick is Savage Dragon. Spawn was too much of an edgelord. Young Bloods <laughs> felt really like corporate D bags, and Wildcats, albeit beautiful, felt like X Men. Savage Dragon was fun, lots of action, and tried hitting uh, dinner topics without getting overboard. He wraps up Hasta la Proxima, mis amigos, T Mix. All very fair reviews. Yeah. No, that was a, I mean, <laughs> it took us an hour and a half to do this review, and my man, you know, knocked out four or five image titles in, in one uh, sentence. Good stuff. T Mix, thank you so much. Um, I guess T-Mix, let me know if you still want this um, uh, Green Lantern variant. If not, I'll, I'll do another giveaway for it in um, another episode. But thank you so much for that email. Much appreciated. And speaking about giveaways and emails and all that, don't forget that we'll be raffling off a pristine copy of a 9.8 CGC graded copy of Deadly Class Number 1. 
uh market market price uh you know what, what is, isn't it like market price when you buy fish it's like well, what's the market price mm-hmm. market price of that is like a hundred dollar value all right so you're getting a hundred dollar value book uh for basically free if you win it all right it's going to be free to enter in this contest and you can get up to three raffle tickets in total i'm gonna have the rules posted in the show notes or just go over to our instagram and find the post for more information and yeah big shout out to our partners at Shortboxed for this giveaway. It's the app that's making it easier and safer to buy and sell graded comics online. It's available on iOS and Android devices. So check out the app and enter the giveaway. I mean, look, you ain't got nothing to lose. I mean, I'm gonna make the I'm gonna make the contest easy. And if you win uh, Deadly Class number one, uh, it's gonna look good on your wall for as long as you can keep it from Ashley. It looked real good on my wall. <laughs> Just in case you get it and you're not really feeling it. She's got her yeah. kid signed up to King Dominion early. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley's going to be like, hey, Potter, what was the name of the uh, the winner? I want to send them some original artwork. I'm like, oh, Ashley, that's so sweet of you. Hand delivered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So check out the giveaway. Thanks again, T-Mix, for the, um, for the email. Like I said, I'll have all of that information in the show notes and rules. While you do that, it's a perfect time to tell you about the best entertainment options Worthy of your time that are personally backed by us. It's time for champion season. It's time, it's time for, for champion season. For those of you tuning in for the first time, champion season is the part of the show where we answer the burning question of what else you should be up on. By highlighting other worthwhile entertainment like movies, TV series, books, video games, and anything else we'd personally recommend to our friends. Ashley, you've been on a roll this entire episode, so I'm going to have you kick us off. What are you going to champion today? Okay, so I've got three today, so I'll uh, go through them real quick. Um, First one is House of the Dragon. Have you guys been watching this? Ashley, Sunday, uh, it comes on at 9 o'clock. At 8 o'clock, it's shutdown yeah. time. It's stop doing, wrap up whatever you're doing, get ready to sit on this couch. I still haven't watched House of Dragon yet. I still haven't forgiven him. Ed, uh, you will quickly forget. Hurt. You will quickly forget. You know all that bullshit of the last Game of Thrones season. But uh, yeah, Ashley, it's great. Yeah, no, you're literally. You'll be like, you know what, Jamie and Cersei, <laughs> we should have left you alone. <laughs> we were too hard on you. We were way too hard. <laughs> we on We were you guys. too hard on you guys. You start hook up as young as you want. <laughs> But yeah, I, I've been really uh, getting excited. Like Sunday morning, I wake up and I'm like, oh, it's Game of Thrones day. Same. Um, the second one is, I swear somebody must, must have championed this because this is too good for you guys not to have championed this. I just wasn't paying attention. But um, Primal oh, um, yeah. by Gendy Tartakovsky. See, has. I, yeah, Sia has. I think Drew has at some point. I've probably hopped on the bandwagon late, but I, yeah, it's definitely been it's it's been shown some love. I did I forgot the latest season came out recently. So there's something I don't know, like just not having dialogue and just like a guy and a dinosaur. <laughs> like there's just so much emotion in there. Big it time. is so good. Big time. Um, and then the last one is a movie that I actually I saw it. And then I went home and bought tickets and went and saw it the next week. Um, Bullet Train. Oh, I want to see that. That was on my list. And I think I it's still in theaters, right? Like, I'm not too late. Yeah. So, and also, if you live in Jacksonville, that brand new Cinemark on Atlantic, um, $6 movies on Tuesday nights. Ooh, that's way So, up I there. went and saw Bullet Train one Tuesday and then went and saw it the next Tuesday. <laughs> it's just, it's like John Wick, but all the hitmen are Filipino funny. Bakery over down Ooh, the street the say so sweets yeah no or the baker son oh i haven't been there yeah it's awesome um but yeah it's just it's so much fun it's like so action-packed um i'm gonna go ahead and say it i think michael shannon is my favorite actor i love michael shannon because he can he can play intense and he can play funny but he is he always plays creepy <laughs> like he's just real good <laughs> facts um so yeah definitely that too he's got a very strong face what was that he uh, does uh, have a strong face what was that um oh my gosh uh the, the movie with the uh underwater creature the shape of water he was in that one right if i'm not yes, mistaken, he very was in that intense one. so intense like i was like imagine if that was your boss that dude is like a stickler for the fucking rules. Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Good ones, Ashley. Not only did you like share some really good, um, you know, uh, champion picks, but also uh, our 904 listeners, you know, our Jax listeners are sitting here writing down the name of this uh, this Filipino bakery. Like, oh, there's two of them? Two. <laughs> All right, Ed, what about you, man? What are you going to champion? 
I'm going to champion. I just got it. It is the. It's a goon, kind of like a, a not a spinoff, but it's basically like a one shot. It's called the Lords of Misery. Um, Eric Powell, and basically it's the goon. Basically, I think it's every the story is still kind of floating in my head. So I think it's like every hundred or so years, basically like a group of people are just kind of brought together to fight this cosmic evil in this incarnation. It's the goon and some other kind of odd kind of almost golden age twisted kind of golden age type people to fight this, you know, cosmic force. Like I said, it's like a 60 page comic. It's like a little one shot. It's like 10 bucks. It's like I said, if you like uh, the goon, it's a cool little, you know, one shot to add to the, to the collection. Good stuff. Yeah, anything else, Ed? Nope. All right. So I've, I'm much like Ashley. I've got three. Oh, it's like two and then an honorary one. So every now and then I get into these like, God damn it, I'm going to get my money's worth for all these streaming apps I'm paying for, specifically mm-hmm. like uh, the, the comic book ones. So my first one is from like the Shonen Jump app, um, and that's Spy Family. Have you guys heard of It's like a manga and an anime. Have you guys heard about this? Mm-hmm. Um, I started reading the manga on the Shonen Jump app. Which, for the record, is an amazing app for two dollars a month. I mean, the amount of hmm. like manga and comics you get is well worth it. But I know Spy Family is a Netflix series or Netflix anime series. Um, I'm talking about the manga in particular. It is written and illustrated by Tetsuya Indo. I believe that's how you say his name. And the story follows a spy. His name is Twilight. He, like he's like the most badass spy of all time, and he's given a mission to build a fake family to infiltrate like this political uh, target. And it's like this uh, mission that's supposed to like keep peace between these two rival nations. So he adopts a uh, little orphan girl named Anya. And he doesn't realize that like she's, she's a telepath, like she can read minds and she's got like, you know, those type of talents. Um, And then he finds a woman to, uh, to marry, to kind of like keep up this fake facade and be his wife. But he doesn't know that she is a skilled assassin. So like, there's all these secrets among them. Like she also doesn't know about his, you know, his spy life and, or the girl and, and vice versa. The only one that knows everything is the girl because she can, you know, the little girl because she can read minds. So everyone's got like a secret and they're doing their best not to like show anyone their true selves. But in the process of them being a fake family and, you know, doing their dirt, you know, at nighttime and, and you know, behind everyone's back, they end up like learning a lot about each other. They grow as a family in unexpected ways. Um, and it's like, it is just so lighthearted. It's I know the premise sounds kind of dark and and you know there's secrets and all double lives, but it is so lighthearted. It is so fun and the little girl in this um manga Anya is so adorable. I have found myself like <laughs> like like audibly being in bed reading this like oh like all night and life is like for the love of god <laughs> shut up, you know. <laughs> it's really cute, man. There's a bunch of volumes <laughs> available on Shonen Jump. Um, I'll probably read through the whole manga before I, I even watch the um, anime. But Spy Family is awesome if mm. you want something like lighthearted and fun. Uh, the next thing I'll, I'll champion, you know, once again, this is uh, me just kind of looking at all of my comic streaming apps. Uh, and that is Nice House on the Lake. Are you guys familiar with this title by James Tinian? I've seen it. I'm not. I have. Um, yeah, I've read the first three, but I've got them all. It's okay. on my pull list. So the first Six issues, I think, are on the DC um, Universe app. So I kind of dived into that after reading um, Something is Killing the Children. I was like, man, let me see what else James, you know, kind of talking, doing what we've been talking about, following a writer. I want to see what else he's done. And the covers for this is what piqued my interest because it's like hyper photorealistic covers. And it looks like some shit out of like The um, uh, the Last of Us, like how mm-hmm. it's like all the covers kind of capture this very eerie moment in a, what looks like an abandoned house. Uh, it's written by James Tinian alongside uh, uh, artist Alvaro Martinez Bueno. I think that's how you say his name. And the overall premise is an undercover alien has been living on Earth as a human named Walter. And he's like been selectively throughout the course of his life, like selectively befriending a bunch of people from various walks of lives and professions. And he ends up tricking them well into like adulthood to staying with him at a like futuristic, all inclusive style summer lake house. Unbeknownst to them, while the world is ending due to like an alien invasion, or at least you're led to believe like an alien invasion. By the time that like everyone starts to realize what's going on, they realize, oh shit, we're trapped in this like lake house because of Walter and shit just gets fucking weird. It is, it's like, it's got body horror. It's got like mystery. It's, it's like, uh, to me, it feels like reading 
the Blair Witch Trial meets like real world meets like signs in a comic book format. It is like amazing. I don't know, Ashley, if, if you felt the same way reading the first three issues, but I've been loving it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a glowing endorsement. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so like I got it for the covers and the Tinian. Um and it's yeah, the even the first issue, you're like, something's really strange here. Like it just it's like unsettling. <laughs> yeah, it's uh alien flesh tornado is, is what I'll say. It's it's <laughs> so, so fucking weird, man. But uh it's kept my interest. And my honorary champion is Dragon Ball Superheroes. All right. It is the latest. Dragon Ball Z kind of like, I don't know if it's a spinoff movie or it's kind of like, it's canon, but it's like a side story. Anyways, it's a uh, it's a movie that um, I guess has been like been showing in select theaters. I, I watched it at Regency um, in July. I took my little nephew as a cover up so that way I didn't feel self-conscious about being a grown ass man watching a Dragon Ball Z movie. <laughs> but little did I know it was filled with a bunch of other 30 year old males <laughs> in there. My nephew was actually the youngest <laughs> kid in there. So my cover got blown, but I had a good time. Um, and I'll say this, it's not, as a lifelong Dragon Ball Z fan, it is not absolutely required viewing um, if you're a Dragon Ball Z fan. But if you are fully aware of what, if you're fully aware of what Dragon Ball Z or Dragon Ball is at this point in regards to like writing and the stakes and the usual tropes, and you don't mind like a story centered on Gohan and Piccolo, it is more than serviceable. It's a lot of fun. And I'll even give them props for trying something new with the animation style. It's not like you're you know, traditional animation style. It looks more like a 3D video game type of uh, look to it. I think it's still showing in theaters, Ed, if, if you're interested in, in checking out Dragon Ball Super Heroes. I'll have to find some... No, nah, that's going to sound <laughs> weird. Find some little kid to go for. No, nah, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> I'm going to put that out there. This episode just got flagged. <laughs> All right, so once again, uh, Dragon Ball Super Heroes, Nice House on the Lake, and Spy Family are my champions. Short Box Nation, it's your turn to chime in. If you got a killer champion that we should be checking out, share it with us. Stop hoarding all the good shit, all right? Tell us about it, all right? Or tell us if you try out any of the recommendations that we shared today. We'd love to get some feedback. Hit us up on Instagram, Twitter, or email. Ashley, it's been a minute since I had you do the uh, you know episode wrap-up. Oh. Um, do you got any words to share about this episode in particular? Did you learn anything new? Do you got anything to share um, as, as parting words to the listeners? Um, I guess I'm just feeling kind of sentimental about this episode. Um, I mean, I think we all agree that Rick Remender is really good at introducing characters that you absolutely like relate to and in some way and fall in love with. Um, Every series that I've read from his from start to finish, like he just sticks the landing every time. Um, And then... uh, I'm not even mad that you've been ignoring my Alan Moore <laughs> art writer spotlight Dude, comments for the past few months. Like, I'm glad that Rick Remender was our first writer spotlight. Would it be appropriate to play I Don't Want to Wait by Paula Cole right now? <laughs> I don't want to wait. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll have that music underlaid. Uh, they're, they're at that. that is how I'm feeling. Yeah, I'm feeling sentimental, too. This was um, this was solid. I, I, you know what? I, I think it's safe to say that Going forward, we'll definitely start doing more episodes about writers in particular. Alan Moore, to me, would just be a very interesting episode to do. It would be a tough one. Yeah, it would. You know, We're like, just doing his Lost Girls book. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> Sex. Trump. It would be a... That would... It's been a while since we've done like two-part episodes, but I feel like that one would warrant at least a two-part. And I feel like we would have to get Cesar on it. Just because it would be the closest to us actually getting Alan Moore. Yeah, you can do the <laughs> voice the whole time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, there you have it, Short Box Nation. Thank you for hanging out with us this week. If you enjoyed this episode, please do us a favor and help spread the word to a friend or someone you know that loves comics as much as we do. And if you're feeling extra generous, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It won't cost you nothing except for maybe 10 seconds and a couple of nice words, but it would mean a lot to us. Next week, we'll be recapping the latest comic news and headlines from this month that you might have missed. All right, it's been a lot of a lot has gone down in the comic industry, and we'll, we'll talk about that next week. So make sure you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss out on that. And if you want more short box content to hold you over until then, become a member of our Patreon community for on demand access. I thought that just sounded, you know, fancy to bonus episodes and videos. Click the link in the show notes to get to our Patreon community or just go to patreon.com slash shortbox to check out what's waiting for you there. 
Until we meet again, Short Box Nation, take care of yourselves. Have a great day. And please continue to make mine and yours short box. We'll talk to you soon. Peace.